evening. Uh, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Gary, are you ready? Yes, I am. Please. Oh, thou kind Lord, this gathering is turning to thee. These hearts are radiant with thy love. These minds and spirits are exhilarated by the message of thy glad tidings. O oh God, let this American democracy become glorious in spiritual degrees, even as it has aspired to material degrees, and render this just government victorious. Confirm this revered nation to appraise the standard of the oneness of humanity, to promulgate the most great peace, to become thereby most glorious and praiseworthy among all the nations of the world. O oh God, this American nation is worthy of thy favors and is deserving of thy mercy. Make it precious and near to thee through thy bounty and bestowal. Moji, are you ready? Yes, Dr. Bashalai. This is from some answer questions. Consider, could the law of the Old Testament be enforced at this epoch and time? No, in the name of God, it would be impossible and impracticable. Therefore, most certainly, God abrogated the laws of the Old Testament at the time of Christ. Reflect also that baptism in the days of John the Baptist was used to awaken and admonish the people to repent from all sin and to watch for the appearance of the kingdom of Christ. But at present in Asia, the Catholics and the Orthodox Church plunge newly born children into water mixed with olive oil, and many of them become ill from the shock. At the time of baptism, they struggle and become ag agitated. In other places, the clergy sprinkle the water of baptism on the forehead, but neither from the first form nor from the second do the children derive any spiritual benefit. Oh, then what result is obtained from this form? Other peoples are amazed and wonder why the infant is plunged into the water, since this is neither the cause of the spiritual awakening of the child, nor of its faith or conversion, but it is only a custom which is followed. In the time of John the Baptist, it was not so. No, at first John used to exhort the people and to guide them to repentance from sin and to fill them with the desire to await the manifestation of Christ. Whoever received the ablution of baptism and repented of sins in absolute humility and meekness would also purify and cleanse his body from outward impurities. With perfect yearning, day, night and day, he would constantly wait for the manifestation of Christ and the entrance to the kingdom of the spirit of God. Thank you. Albers, are you ready? I am ready. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a treat in front of us tonight. Uh, not one, but two absolutely exceptional speakers uh, who have come to give us their wisdom. Uh, and I'd like to begin by reading their little self appointed biographies here that came along with the email that you all received. Ray Ciafardini lives in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and is a transformational coach and certified trainer of neuro-linguistic programming, which as an aside, are both fascinating topics that you can hear him talk about on Clubhouse from every now and again. Uh, he helps people release negative emotional baggage, limiting beliefs, and empowers them to live their best lives. Having started his professional career in sales, he saw the need to help people create and maintain meaningful change in their lives. Alex Kalodner is a Baha'i living in Maryland. He serves on the local spiritual assembly of Montgomery County East. He works with individuals with substance use disorder, 
attained long lasting recovery and formerly worked in the foreclosure prevention space for five years. He contributes to many firesides and deepenings, often helping the technical portion of the program. He is husband to, Cla to Carolyn and father to Lena, both of whom he cherishes greatly. Now, if you were paying attention, and I hope you were, you might have noticed that I did not mention where either of these individuals went to seminary, because they didn't. That's a hallmark of these types of talks. These are individuals whose entire lives are dedicated to something absolutely fascinating. And then when they're done with their day jobs, they come to study to become scholars in the faith, a status that both of them have achieved. There's a lot of wisdom in what they do. A lot of effort has been put forward in that kind of regard. I hope to emulate it one day within my own life. Uh, and without much further ado, I hand it over to our two esteemed guests. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Albers. That is such a funny introduction because Albors is the smarter of the three of us. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining tonight. And uh, we're excited to, this is going to be our uh, uh, Ray's and I's first fireside together and hopefully not our last. Uh, we're excited to uh, be speaking with you all this evening. Uh, and so what we're going to start off with is just a brief introduction to firesides for those that this is your first fireside. Uh, and then also talk about what the Baha'i faith is for those that haven't Googled it already. Uh, from there, we'll actually jump into our topic for this evening, which is progressive revelation. And from there, we'll look at some personal examples. You know, we'll share some personal stories and then we'll actually look at some definitive text. We'll, we'll actually dive a little bit deeper there uh, and just, just play around with uh, three or four examples this evening. Uh, because what we really want to do is get straight into the Q&A. Uh, and that leads back to the introductory uh, text from this evening, which comes from, uh, uh, from online. And so what we're going to do here is also share with you uh, one of the big things that is difficult in a virtual environment that we would normally have in a physical environment is uh, a, 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 a printout where you could actually follow along. So for those that would like to, uh, and I know that some of you do multitask while you are uh, on the Zoom room, so hopefully you can have that, uh, instead of a multitask, you can have our uh, text open this evening. So in the chat is a link to all the text that we're going to reference this evening. Uh, so feel free to print that out or just have that open alongside. So going back to the introductory text, uh, the first one for this evening, it's uh, for, that firesides are informal gatherings for introductory conversations about the Baha'i faith, and they are excellent opportunities, this is the emphasis here, for people to ask questions and learn about the faith's teachings and how they relate to contemporary life. So for progressive revelation, uh, it's important because it speaks to the very concept of why there is another religion from God. Why didn't God just send one manifestation? Why did he send multiple religions? And especially because, you know, we as Baha'is, we believe that God is the all-knowing and the all-wise. Uh, if he's the all-wise, why didn't he just send us a computer 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago with all the information that we need? And that way, you know, here we are today, we could just go back and search that computer. Why did he need to continuously send a new manifestation that's constantly updating the message? Uh, so that brings us to the Baha'i faith uh, or Baha'u'llah, which is uh, for the Baha'is, who we believe to be the most recent manifestation of God. He was born in uh, the 1800s and also died in the 1800s in 1892. And one of the beautiful things about the recency with which Baha'u'llah lived is that he, he was both literate and had access to pen and paper. And the beautiful thing there too is that we have a lot of the original writings in his own handwriting that were, are still, you know, still today preserved uh, in the uh, archives, which is located in Haifa, Israel. And I'll just read one brief passage that Baha'u'llah wrote that really speaks to the purpose of the messengers and the prophets uh, as it relates to today. And so Baha'u'llah explains, and again, we as Baha'is believe this, that the prophets and messengers of God have been sent down for the sole purpose of guiding mankind to the straight path of truth. The purpose underlying the revelation hath been to educate all men. And of course, the quote goes on uh, talking about the fact that this education leads to, upon our ascent, our, 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 our ability to reunite with God and uh, reunite with this, with this station, the kingdom of heaven, these different uh, names for a very similar concept. 
uh, but really it's, it's meant for our advancement as, human, uh, as humans. So as we go about tonight's topic, and really if you join us for any other fireside, the goal here is really to talk about how we in our own individual capacity can move humanity forward. How can we unite each other? How can we make sure that we are supporting each other, whether it's in a pandemic setting or five years ago, hopefully when we're not in a pandemic setting, how can we continue to guide each other uh, along this straight path? Uh, and that really speaks to, for those that uh, love to study history and love to study the root, you know, the, the root words uh, or the root meaning of words, uh, religion itself is a combination of a few different, of three different meanings. So if you break the word religion apart, you'll find it's R-E, you know, the first part of that word is, I mean, translates to again. Uh, L-I-G, the rest of it, that comes from the Latin word ligio, which means the binding. And the last part of the word, I-O-N, is the act of. So here we have, put it all together, the act of binding. Uh, and this is both in a human capacity where we're binding each other. Uh, we are binding ourselves to our neighbors and to our family and to our friends and also in a religious capacity where we're binding ourselves to God. So with that being said, uh, Ray, when you became a Baha'i uh, and uh, folks asked you, so you are the religion that believes in all religions. Uh, is that right? How do you respond? Yes. Yeah, so my journey in the Baha'i faith started at a fireside just like this one. It was uh, um, mid 2000s and we were invited to um, Dr. Uh, Nasser's and Ziva's home for a fireside. And when I started exploring this and eventually declared as a Baha'i, yeah, that question came up a lot whenever people found out that I was a Baha'i that asked, you know, or it wasn't really a, uh, it, it wasn't really a question. They would just come out and say, oh yeah, that's the religion where you just believe all religions. And, and to start this off, right, as we get into kind of a definition of what progressive revelation is, it's, it's not a belief in all religions, it's that all religion, it's one religion. And there's a fundamental difference between the two. So, yeah, so I let them know, you know, with a smile on my face, I'm like, actually, you know, that's, that's more than most people know about the Baha'i faith, right? And it's, it's a belief that it's one religion that's been progressively revealed by God throughout the ages. So, to give you a quick definition of what is progressive revelation, and then we're going to dig into this concept at a much deeper level, it's that throughout the ages, God has sent divine messengers known as manifestations of God. Alex referenced Baha'u'llah being the most recent, uh, and among them, Abraham, Krishna, Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, um, the Bab, and then again, most recently, Baha'u'llah, and they were sent to cultivate humanity's spiritual, intellectual, and moral capacities. And following the coming of a manifestation of God, extraordinary progress occurs in the world, reaching to the roots of human motiva uh, motivation. His teachings awaken in whole populations capacities to, contri to contribute to the advancement of society. And when we think about what's happened since 1892, or even just the 1800s, when we look at the last um, you know, the last hundred years or so, the amazing things that have come about. So with each of these manifestations, it injects a new energy into the world. So that was, Alex alluded to that idea of why does God keep sending these manifestations? Why is it one continuous religion consistently revealed throughout time? Well, something if you've been around Dr. Nasser or been other firesides, you're probably familiar with this idea that in nature, nature moves towards chaos, right? It's this idea of entropy. And the only way to bring order to a chaotic system is to inject new energy into it. And that's exactly what these manifestations have done throughout time. So, you know, what? in alignment with that question of, oh, you're the religion that believes that all religions are correct. Well, again, that it's one religion it's not that they're separate religions. We just happen to believe they're all right. It's that it's one religion. When we look at how this connects the Baha'i faith, right? Um, like Alex said, we're going to get into some specific examples when it comes to laws. But just on the surface, when we look at things like in the time of Abraham, right? Abraham created this idea of the family unit. And then Moses created the tribes. And then Jesus connected the tribes. And then Muhammad created the nations. 
And then Baha'u'llah is here or came to unite the world. And the question often comes up, well, isn't that what they all did? And the answer is yes. And that was respect. To, it, it, and that was with respect to what the people could handle at the time, right? So when we look at something like the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shall not commit adultery, right? Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife. Well, when Jesus eventually came and delivered his message, well, it was thou shall not think of coveting thy neighbor's wife. Man moved or humans moved from this idea of just the doing to the thinking, right? Because that message had to come first for the latter message to make sense. So, and I'd like to explain this concept in the most, um, in a way that hopefully it can be received by everyone that the idea that throughout time that one manifestation was, was greater than another, I, I'd like to kind of put that to rest tonight um, through the teachings of the Baha'i faith that when we look, for example, take elementary school, you may have a third grade teacher and a fourth grade teacher. Well, they could teach the same thing. They went they went to the same school, they learned the same material. Well, why does a fourth grade teacher teach different material than a third grade teacher? Because they're teaching to the capacity of the student, not what they know. And there's a, and, I, and, and that's an important distinction. So when we look at the writings, and this is, a, this is in the document that uh, Alex shared, it says, know of a certainty that in every dispensation, the light of divine revelation hath been vouchsafed unto men in direct proportion to their spiritual capacity. Consider the sun, how feeble its rays the moment it appeareth above the horizon, how gradually its warmth and potency increase at it as it approacheth the, its zenith, enabling meanwhile all created things to adapt themselves to the growing intensity of its light. How steadily it declineth until it reacheth its setting point. Were it all of a sudden to manifest the energies latent within it, it would no doubt cause injury to all created things. In like manner, if the Son of Truth were suddenly to reveal at the earliest stages of its manifestation, the full measure of the potencies which the providence of the Almighty hath bestowed upon it, the earth of human understanding would waste away and be consumed. For men's hearts would neither sustain the intensity of its revelation, nor be able to mirror forth the radiance of its light. Dismayed and overpowered, they would cease to exist. And I'll share on a personal note that this, th this idea of progressive revelation, when I went on my spiritual journey, that this was, um, if you heard me speak a couple of months ago, you know, I mentioned that when I first heard about the Baha'i faith, I went on a mission to prove the Baha'i faith wrong. That that was, I'm like, they're either right, right? And I need to be a Baha'i or I need to just prove the Baha'i faith wrong. And it was through this examination of, uh, of progressive revelation where I needed it to make sense up here first for me to see how the dots connected along the way. And, um, and that was a powerful journey. And, you know, one of the questions that did come to mind, well, kind of like Alex started with, well, how is it that the message why wasn't the message the same? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Why couldn't, you know, Moses or Jesus just given us all we needed? Well, that last passage from Baha'u'llah, you know, when we take that to, I don't want to say a real world scenario, but to put this in just kind of things that we may have all experienced, you know, a, a parent may tell a three-year-old, don't play with the stove and don't talk to strangers. Well, when that same child turns 18, well, then the conversation may be, hey, I need you to start dinner and get butter from the neighbor that you've never met. Well, the rules have now changed. While it was don't play with the stove and don't talk to strangers, now it's, hey, start dinner, go get butter from someone you've never met, because it had nothing to do with the person sharing the message. It had everything to do with the capacity of the student, and the previous message was needed before, before that latter message could be delivered. And again, Bahala says, contemplate with thine inward eye the chain of successive revelations that had linked the manifestation of Adam with that of the Bob. I testify before God that each one of these manifestations hath been sent down through the operation of the divine will and purpose that each hath been the bearer of a specific message 
that each hath been entrusted with a divinely revealed book and been commissioned to unravel the mysteries of a mighty tablet. So again, just going back to what Alex had said, why, why, why weren't we just given everything 2000 years ago? Because as people, as a human race, we weren't able to handle it, that the message of world unity wouldn't have made sense when the world didn't really exist because they didn't have the scope to understand that. So Alex, I, any elaboration on that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think I want to go back to one of the things you said, uh, because certainly for those joining us that are uh, new to the faith or just learning about it for the first time, uh, there was a lot of content there. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that Baha'is believe all the messengers of God not only come from the same God, but are also teaching the same message? Yes. And yes. And that's a great question. So, um, and you know, I, I want to recognize that we kind of come from different backgrounds, right? I found the faith. And I think you had mentioned in our discussion prior to this, that you were, you were exposed to it from birth, correct? Yep. So I was born into the faith uh, and uh, my parents were on here. My mom's a Baha'i. She's been a Baha'i longer than I've been alive. Uh, alive so I was born into it. Though uh, my father was Jewish up until just a few years ago. Uh, and uh, my grandmother was Christian and my uncle who lived with us for quite a while was atheist. So certainly a lot of influences there. You can imagine having an atheist just ram against every single religious concept uh, you know, during your kind of crucial teen years, uh, telling you, yeah, don't believe any of that. Everything they're trying to tell you is just a, is just a lie. It's made up. These people are, 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 are foolish. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the flip side of that, having a spiritual connection and having the Baha'i faith provide all the answers uh, to you know, a lot of the questions that have stumped scholars and philosophers for millennia. Uh, and then having all the answers, it's, it's kind of difficult, I should say, and I should be sympathetic to those that are joining us born in the Baha'i faith. You know, I recognize that uh, w without going through that journey that Ray had, had gone through, that I'm very envious of, uh, uh, of his, his, his experience there, it's difficult to know the questions. So, you know, especially growing around, uh, growing up around Maryland, there's a, folks that have uh, a lot of different religious backgrounds. And many of my friends, for example, all believe that there's one God. Uh, they just call them different. He just called them different words. Uh, and uh, they all believed in the same manifestations that I did as a Baha'i. They all believed in Moses. Uh, some believed in Jesus. Some believed in Muhammad and Jesus. Some believed in Jesus and Moses and Abraham. Uh, these different combinations, depending on what religion, their uh, religious background they came from. And it was very easy as a behind and a little bit, I should say, confusing because for, for me, it was easy to say, yeah, I believe in every single manifestation that you guys just mentioned. In fact, I believe in the same God that you guys just mentioned. Uh, and if we look at the teachings and if we look at the actual text, they all sound very similar. Uh, sure, they have different names, but that's because they come from different cultures and different, uh, they have different languages. So, you know, to, we have different names as a result. Uh, but uh, they all sound really much, you know, pretty much like they're talking about the same thing here, guys. And I'm pretty sure we heard them all say that they all wanted to love each other. Uh, they wanted you to love your neighbor. And nobody, you know, even if we go as far back as the Ten Commandments, nobody that came after the Ten Commandments were revealed told you to not listen to the Ten Commandments. Uh, those those are still valid, even to the time of Baha'u'llah. Uh, those, those timeless teachings remain the same. So definitely coming from a religious, you know, from a Baha'i background, it was very easy to see that though we have different names to our religions and though we have different cultures in the sense that we have different customs, what direction we pray, how often we pray in a day, what foods we are or are not allowed to eat. If we just put those things aside for a second and look at the core spiritual values, it was easy to see that they came from the same source. They all came from, uh, they all talked about one God. They all talked about one manifestation. They talked about a manifestation to come and they talked about loving each other and helping each other. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, please forgive me, go ahead. Uh, keep going, sorry. So th that, what you just shared was, you know, I mentioned how I came about to be a Baha'i that that this idea of progressive revelation was an integral part for me because I needed to see the connections. And eventually what I got to 
was that, and, and this is an example in the Baha'i writings that I, I, I saw this, um, I saw this, that if we view God as the sun and we view each of the manifestations as a perfectly clean mirror, well, the frame around those mirrors, it was Abraham was one frame. Moses was another. Jesus, Muhammad, Zoroaster, Buddha, all of these manifestations were just the frames around those perfectly clean mirrors. And what I realized was when you stripped away the mirrors, when you stripped away the names, yes, thank you. When you stripped away the names, then all that was left, when you stripped away the frames, I should say, for this example, it was just the mirror reflecting just that pure light of God. And when I was able to strip away the names and see that the message was consistent, the spiritual truths, right? Like you said, the, the cultural truths or those, or the ones that were delivered, you know, when Sabbath was stuff like that. Um, when I saw that the spiritual truths were the same, I just saw that it came from the same source. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. And that was an integral part because this image that Alex is sharing on the screen, this is what did it for me, that it wasn't the frame. It was the light being reflected by those individual mirrors. And that was, um, you know, when we look at our world and without getting into the specifics of the text, um, you know, when we look at how God has delivered this message, each of these manifestations have two, um, there are two components to them. There's the one where they're all the same, right? That's in the world of God. And then in our world, there are the distinctions made because of our human capacity, right? The name, that, how they look, that, that they were these manifestations on earth. And um, so, yeah, that was a, uh, th this was integral for me. So, because I needed here to connect before here, that's just kind of how it worked. I needed, yeah, that makes sense. And then everything else kind of followed, but that was huge for me. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Of course, it's always interesting to hear the journey of somebody that has had an experience that, you know, I can, I can never have. Uh, so I hope that was also beneficial for others that are in a similar spot in their, in their journey to know that you're not alone. And this is something that many of folks have gone through. Uh, so Ray at the beginning had mentioned that a lot of times, you know, and, and uh, I'm the same way. That's why Ray and I love to work together. It has to click up top before it you know before it clicks in the heart and so part of making things work uh, from an intellectual standpoint is actually checking the checking the word of god and checking what is written and making sure that yes not only has you know somebody over here whoever i'm learning from told me that the manifestations are teaching the same thing they're talking about the same subject but i need to read that for myself i, I need to check to make sure that it's not something that they just said and, and you know, it's hearsay, but I want to see the text itself. Uh, so with that being said, Ray, do you think we should take a look at perhaps uh, the golden rule? I think that's a good place to start. Cool. So for those that are following along, I'm going to share it on my screen here, or you can follow along. Uh, if you have the page pulled up, uh, you'll be able to see the same information. So one of the most, one of the most uh, basic concepts within every single religion is the golden rule. Uh, and of course, if you're coming to us from America, I know we are uh, moving on a more international nowadays with uh, the, the expansion of technology and, and the benefit of uh, Zoom. Uh, but uh, from the American standpoint, we do have a strong Christian background to our society. And so even growing up, the golden rule always came from its Christian roots. Uh, with that being said, it didn't start there. And even if we go even further back uh, even beyond Judaism, we can find examples of the golden rule, but to limit ourselves to just religious concept, uh, con uh, uh, you know, uh, sources, on your screen right now are a few passages from different religions, each teaching the same basic concept that we should love one another uh, and that we should engage with our neighbors and uh, be friendly and, of course, not hurt them. So whether or not we go back to whether it be Hinduism or Judaism, which are uh, certainly the earliest here for Judaism, it's what is hateful to you, do not to your fellow man. This is the entire law and all the rest is commentary. This joins us from the Talmud, which is a commentary on uh, the Torah. Or from Hin Hinduism, this is the sum of duty. Do not unto others what you would have uh, not have them do unto you. Very similar concepts 
totally different cultures. These cultures never interacted with each other, yet from foundationally reached the same core values. Uh, and then, of course, from Buddhism, you have a very similar message, hurt not unto others in ways you yourself would find hurtful. From Christianity, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye so to them. This is the law and the prophets. Islam, none of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. But I do want to call out the Baha'i faith, and though it's a very similar concept, it changes things ever so slightly. So not only in the Baha'i faith is it blessed is he who prefereth his brother before himself. Uh, it, so it's not only somebody saying, yeah, he has to be equal with you, but it's saying this, you know, to engage in the golden rule, to engage with humanity, we want you to actually prefer your brother. That means if you have, uh, you know, if you have five, let's call them uh, something delicious in Maryland is crab cakes. It's a very, you know, if you're a Marylander, you've had crab cakes. So if you have five crab cakes and you're with your friend, it means you give that third crab cake, you know, that if you were splitting them, you give him three and you take two. And for children, this is a very basic concept. It's very easy to teach. Uh, I have a, a young daughter. It's very easy to teach a concept like equality. Uh, but then to expand that to the concept of, no, 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 we should give more. We should be generous uh, with our division in order to make sure that those around us uh, uh, benefit more than we do. This is a, 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 a certainly a, a growth in the concept of the golden rule uh, and something that as we expand it to more complicated subjects, like how do we make sure that uh, if, we, if we apply it to the world stage, how do we make it so that no matter what country we live, we live in, we're making sure that a country that is more impoverished or uh, has a harder working condition, harder living condition, uh, still has those basic needs met uh, before we engage in luxuries ourselves. Uh, and so this is something that, though it's a very simple sentence right here, Baha'u'llah in his writings talks about uh, on, on how to apply these core values uh, on a world stage, in a social capacity, in a governmental capacity, uh, throughout his writings. Should we look at another ray? Absolutely. And we'll, um, and just so if there are any questions, we'll, uh, as we wrap up tonight, we will be going to Q and A. So if there are any other ones that you're kind of thinking of, you know, we'll share a few more examples here, but we're definitely open to having those conversations during Q and A as well. But yeah, I think so. I think that um, starting with that, I think that's a good, uh, good entry into some of these other topics. Yep. And this is, you know, just to dovetail with what Ray said, we've got for those that are uh, with the open, have the link open. These are just a few here, but there is actually books upon books upon books of scholars that have researched this exact same concept showing that the spiritual concepts and a lot of the uh, even the social laws re uh, remain true no matter what religion you're reading or what religion you're studying. Uh, and of course, taking us back to the idea of progressive re revelation, it makes sense that a religion coming from the same source is going to teach very similar concepts uh, and just make slight adjustments that are relevant to the particular time period, uh, again, related to what foods they eat or what directions they pray uh, or what you know, uh, customs they practice. Uh, and uh, in order to just adjust for the time in which they've arrived. Yeah, and, and Alex, w with some of these, I think it's also important to note that throughout time, and I want to be respectful of everyone listening, that anything that we're sharing is an interpretation from a Baha'i point of view. So there will be some things that we may say that that is looking at it from a Baha'i perspective, right? That, you know, I know that um, one thing we had discussed was how, what each of the messengers said that there will always, or that they talked about that there would be a next messenger, right? And that some of this, there have been interpretations by individual faith. So anything that we're, that we'll share when it comes to these, it is definitely from a Baha'i perspective. Is that fair? Yep, absolutely. And even more minute there, uh, it's from our interpretation of the Baha'i perspective. Since again, we are just individuals. Yeah. So uh, let's jump that. Uh, let's jump to that specific one here. Uh, and we have that titled again for those that are joining us, uh, who are sharing it yourselves, looking at your own screen. This is the page titled Another Will Come. 
And you can see here, we just titled it as timeless. Uh, because as Ray said, every religion seems to talk about the fact that there is always going to be another coming. Uh, so this is a, a law that always applies. And, and even with the Baha'i faith, the, the Baha'i faith makes no attempt to say that we are the last religion. It's very explicit within the Baha'i faith that there will be another religion because uh, humanity changes. And to Ray's quote that he pr uh, provided earlier, it's based upon our capacity at our current time. And so we, as humanity progresses and as we uh, venture to other planets or other galaxies, uh, certainly our intellectual and spiritual and moral capacity broadens. Uh, and therefore we should have a teacher or we should have a message that is um, more reflective of our capacity at that time. Very good. So starting with Christianity, um, this is a passage uh, from the Bible. This is John chapter 16, verses seven through 14. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and he see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So even in, and you can keep going there. Um, I know you have this in front of you, but I'll stop there to that, that right there, even in Christianity, this idea of progressive revelation that God is consistently throughout time revealing himself to us. So I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. That it wasn't, it wasn't this idea of progressive revelation that, that was created, if you will, with the Baha'i faith or revealed through the Baha'i faith. It was something that had been happening um, for eternity since since these manifestations have been coming to us yep and to raise point uh one of the more interesting things is if you open up uh, just a random google page and search progressive revelation you won't see any baha'i sources there you'll see only uh and uh, only churches or uh, pastors or uh, uh different religious religious individuals that ray and i have no association with nor does the baha'i faith uh, but they're talking about progressive revelation and they're talking about it from a, a Christian context uh, about how, you know, the Torah existed, but it needed to be updated. Uh, it needed to have more to it. And that's why Jesus came and he provided uh, an expanded uh, Testament that we know today as the new Testament. Uh, and that that is the reason why we have something called progressive revelation. We have a progressive revealing of God's message to us. And so Baha'is build on that exact same concept uh, that uh, uh, certainly God is leading, you know, is providing more information to us. Uh, and this comes in the form of each of these manifestations and each of these holy texts. I think the, uh, the one I've always loved, uh, even as a teenager studying the writings, is this one from Hinduism, from the Bhagavad Gita, in which he writes, whenever the law declines and the purpose of life is forgotten, I manifest myself on earth. I am born to every age to protect the good, to destroy evil, and reestablish the law. Uh, and certainly, you know, as we look around today, certainly we have parts of our society and parts of our world where the lowest of the lows of humanity exist. And I think it's, it's, it's not a stretch to say that now is the time to remind ourselves what is the law and, and to have that be reestablished. And again, when we talk about the law, it's not, you know, what... Uh, what car do you drive or, you know, what do you do online or anything of that nature, but what is the spiritual law that we need to be reminded of uh, for every day and age? And that spiritual law speaks, you know, largely to such concepts like the golden rule, uh, loving thy neighbor and treating, we, treating each other with respect. Uh, even when, even when we think about ourselves in a, in a global capacity today. Very good. So, would you like to do another one, Alex? Yep. Let's look at, uh, looks, let's do uh, one more and then we can uh, just recap and open it up to the Q&A. Uh, like we said at the beginning, Firesides, for those that have not joined Fireside before, is largely to geared towards uh, questions and answers, uh, which we know in a digital capacity is one of the hardest things to do. So we're hoping to uh, really capitalize upon that this evening. 
So again, starting with uh, Christianity, it says, but I would have you know, and this is under time specific, Alex has it up. Thank you, Alex. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. So time specific, right? That this is something that, um, and I, I guess let's jump straight to the Baha'i faith if you want to elaborate on that one just to show the difference, Alex. Yep. So for Baha'is, uh, we see men and women as two wings of one bird, as Baha'u'llah describes it here, uh, or Abdu Baha, which is the, uh, uh, the next to lead the Baha'i faith. Baha'i faith after Baha'u'llah. He says, one is woman and the other men. Not until both wings are equally developed can the bird fly. And should one wing remain weak, then the flight is impossible. And as he branches out during this conversation, uh, which we welcome you to read, of course, all the sources are there. Abdu'l Baha explains, not until the world of woman becomes equal to the world of men in the acquisition of virtues and perfections can success and prosperity be attained as ought they be. Uh, I think one of the more interesting things as it relates to some of the teachings of the Baha'i faith uh, comes from the next passage, which I, which I won't read, but I'll just summarize by saying uh, it, it's described in the Baha'i faith that ultimately the end of world war will occur be, as a result of women. Because women who have raised their children, who have reared their children, uh, certainly, you know, I, I would say this with or with, I would say this even if my wife was not on this call, I, I recognize that the role of women as it relates to child rearing is uh, uh, certainly a monumental task. And I have full respect for all the work and time and effort that she puts into uh, raising our daughter. And, uh, it, you know, as Baha'u'llah explains, it ultimately... When the women decide they will not send their children off to war, that is when war will stop. And as we have this conversation, and I love that elaboration, Alex, as we have this conversation, there's a, um, you know, from conversations with my friends, you know, we read the Christianity or, or that quote. Um, from Corinthians and then Colossians and Ephesians that, and then we read from the Baha'i writings just reading those two, if they weren't associated with a religion, you know, it's, it's this idea that most people would agree with that nowadays. Right. And it's, it happens regardless. It happens regardless that that's the way that the world tends to move. So when these things came, you may be listening now and saying, well, yeah, that's obvious men and women are equal. And exactly right? That's, uh, that's kind of the point that man, humans evolve, right? Men and women, we evolve. And these things make sense for this time. And I think it's important to recognize that when Baha'u'llah said this, this was the 1800s, right? So I think that what's important, or for me, what's important to recognize without projecting too much is that it's hard to think back to a time that we weren't a part of, it's, it's really hard to think back to a time that we weren't a part of that. It's easy now, current day to say, yes, men and women are equal. But to think when, when this was revealed in the 1800s, you know, I don't know what it was like back then. Right. I, I can't put myself in that mind frame. You, you can't, you can't not know something after you know it. So it's most people would agree today that men and women are equal. Right. And this was revealed in the 1800s before that was a popular idea. So, Ray, let me ask you, uh, in the Baha'i writings, we have a lot of texts related to, or uh, not a lot, but we have texts related to the fact that humanity will one day, and again, remember, Baha'u'llah is writing this in the mid-1800s, in the middle of, you know, he, he's not in San Francisco, he's not in, uh, uh, he's not in any sort of uh, Silicon Valley culture, but he's writing in our, in his, in his writings, you'll find references to the fact that Baha'is will, or uh, humans will one day talk with each other as if uh, talk with somebody on the other side of the globe in an instant, like lightning mm -hmm. uh, that will be able to communicate and send message messages to each other in an instant. Uh, you know, did people take words like that and instantly understand such a message or, you know, was it even hard for them to believe uh, e even being 150 years out of, of uh, when that was ultimately capable? 
Yeah, I, I would say absolutely, right? That those are, that's the beauty, I believe, of the power that's released through these manifestations, that it's that energy that allows us to, to do those things, right? We talked, you know, it's that idea, going back to that idea of energy, that when the world is in chaos, well, things don't come out of chaos, right? Like great ideas don't come out of chaos, sometimes out of necessity, absolutely. And um, yeah, there was like, that's hard to believe in those moments, right? At a time when men and women aren't equal to say that it requires men and women to be equal. Yeah, they absolutely had a hard time believing that regardless of what it was, right? And that's, they aren't telling what is, they're telling what will be. Well said. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what we want to do now is I just want to remind you that, again, the firesides are a time for uh, informal gatherings, for introductory conversations about the Baha'i faith. And there are excellent opportunities for people to ask questions and learn about how the faith's teachings relate to contemporary life. So tonight, Ray and I talked about how the Baha'is believe that all the religions come from the same God, that it's not that we are talking about uh, a, a new religion per se, or that we believe in just taking all the religions and you know putting them all together and creating something new. Uh, but it's this timeless faith that we believe in uh, that is the same as if you're joining us from a Christian background or if you're same, it's the same as if you're joining us from a Jewish background or a Muslim background. Uh, we all believe in the same God coming from the same source, uh, teaching the same common message. Uh, and so we invite you to learn more about uh, how the Baha'is are involved in uh, all the activities that the Baha'is are involved in today. Uh, there's certainly something for everyone, uh, whether it be working with children to talk about spiritual values or working with female immigrants uh, fighting for their rights on an interna international stage to uh, folks making music and movies about common values like loving one's neighbor. Uh, there's certainly an activity for everybody uh, and there's always a way to get involved. Very good. So we will uh, we'll transition now. If you uh, have any questions, you can uh, send them directly to Alex or I. And okay, here we go. Found it interesting. Okay, so this is from Moji. I have I found it interesting that the term progressive revelation is used in the Christian faith to denote a somewhat similar concept, yet limited to the Bible. Do we know when this phrase was first used by the Christian community? Is this a more recent usage of the phrase? Is it widely used by Christians? Great question. So I'm at a disadvantage here, not joining the faith from a different background. Uh, though I will say, again, just a con just a quick cursory Google search, you're going to see a lot of references from other religions to progressive revelation, and they they do come specifically from Christianity. Uh, I think that uh, certainly from the fact that they have access to the internet, and these folks are dealing on a on the internet, they tend to deal on a more global level. Um, it may be a more recent response to <laughs> arguments used against them, uh, arguments used against Christianity of why we need, what, you know, why do you need a, a, a re-upping of faith? Uh, why do you need a new faith rather than just stay with what God had originally revealed? But uh, uh, that's a that's a great question and certainly one to dive deeper into. I don't know if Ray, you have a further to talk about on that one. As far as the specific term, um, I was raised Catholic. As far as the specific term, no. And um, interestingly, one of the, um, well, I'll use Islam as an example, right? One of the critiques of Islam is that there's, is that so much of it, like I, I believe, in, and I may be wrong on this, so please forgive me, that it's, um, you know, over a third of the Quran is biblical, right? So when we look at even the writings in the New Testament and what Jesus said, a lot of that is pulled from the Old Testament. So while the language wasn't there, I think there's absolutely a recognition. So whether it's labeled as progressive revelation, I haven't seen it in any of the writings like spoken kind of the way we're speaking about it now, but I think the recognition has been there. And in fact, it's been a critique used that other religions have pulled so much from other religions if that makes sense. So does that help Moshi? Did that? Okay. Very good. In fact, uh, uh, Ray, uh, you're absolutely right. One third of Quran is all about different religion. And in fact, brings about some things that is not in the holy books of uh, 
baptism, for example, it gives a title to, to Christ that even Muhammad doesn't give it to himself. He said the spirit of God, the word of God, the, I mean, the all kinds of appellation that is really amazing and gives the history of that, builds on that, that Islam is built on all these previous religion. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Uh, word speaks for itself, uh, uh, but uh, we have to look and read. This is a time now that we have to read our presentation. I'm really, I love both of you for this uh, very, very beautiful, uh, lucid really presentation uh, that made it so easy for us to understand that how we can build on this and one religion really had been elaborated over and over and over. And to, to that point, I guess a little bit more about my story and then we'll get to the questions that what, what, personally, when I went on that journey of reading the, reading the primary texts of the world's religions, that the dots that were connected, that in and of itself for me was evidence. Because when I could read the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, like all of these texts, it, to believe that without hyperlinking, like, you know, without the use of some phenomenal tool to make that many connections through that dense of writings over such a long period of time, I just couldn't wrap my head around how any human could pull that off because, because of how it, it was unbelievable once I read those. And this was after I declared to be a Baha'i. So I was reading it from that perspective, but there was just so much connected that I couldn't read it and be like, there's no way this makes sense. Like mm -hmm. the, it, it just clicked for me. Right. And there's more to the story than that, but just reading all of those texts, it was um, yeah. Like so much was there that was connected. And like Alex said, they're from different cultures, different time periods without, without the technology we have now, I just, I can't wrap my head around how that would have been possible. Well, and in some ways, you know, that's, I always go back to the Bible because everything is, everything that we're talking about today has always been written there. It's, you can always find the source. Uh, and I'm thinking about the last passage of Daniel in which God is communicating with Daniel. And he says, essentially, the book has been sealed until the time of the end. And at the time of the end, I'm, sum I'm summarizing here, the time of the end, the book will be unsealed. Uh, and so for Baha'is, this time of the end is the coming of the next manifestation. Uh, and that arrived with Baha'u'llah, who was able to, uh, you know, talk about all these different concepts, explain the mysteries of the prophecies, explain the mysteries of the teachings, uh, and do so in a way that uh, it's like when you learn two plus two equals four. Uh, it just makes sense. You can prove it. 10 different ways uh, but at the end of the day it's 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 it becomes such a different uh, such a simple concept that uh, it's part of your everyday life so you know growing up again in the baha'i faith and hearing that all these religions come from the same god and they're all teaching the same thing and and certainly have different backgrounds uh, it just makes sense uh, it starts to click and then when you see and you read the text and you start to see the parallels uh, it's it's like a tightly woven fabric uh, that as you trace each thread you see how intertwined it is in the religion next to it. And Ray, I, I know we were talking about uh, uh, just before, you know, even in Christianity, we have that overlap that a lot of people uh, don't readily remember as it relates not only from Judaism to Christianity, but also Zoroastrianism to Christianity. Do you want to uh, uh, talk a little bit more about the story of the three wise men? Yeah, so that was, and my timeline on, on learning this, I believe it was while I was studying um, the Baha'i faith prior to becoming a Baha'i, that um, the, the three wise men were Zoroastrian, that Jesus fulfilled a prophecy in Zoroastrianism, that, that, um, that that's been consistent in in other faiths and without being able to quote dates and stuff like that, that readily that's other religions have predicted these things, right? They, these manifestations filled the prophecies of multiple religions. You know, Jesus didn't just come for, um, for the Jewish people. He came for the world 
and that was the fulfillment of other prophecies. So that was, um, yeah, the, I, again, just going back to that idea of just so many dots connected, right? That's, uh, that's how we know things are real with our senses, right? If, if I can taste it, if I can smell it, if I can touch it, the more senses I can use, the more real something becomes. And I think, you know, for me personally, again, just using my journey as an example, um, an example, not the example, but an example that the more things I could touch, it just made this more real. Right. And the more dots I saw connected, the, the realer it made it for me. So, yeah, that's a uh, I was fascinated when I learned that, that Jesus wasn't just coming for the Jewish people at the time. He was coming for the world. And that was, you know, seen through him fulfilling the prophecies of other religions. In fact, uh, on March 26, we will have a Christian scholar who has connected this uh, relationship between Zoroastrian and Christianity. It's going to be a fascinating, fascinating presentation that you are going to hear right here. March 26. Very good. That should be great. Yeah, bookmark yeah. that one. Mm -hmm. so. uh, it has been interesting as we, going back to the concept that we live in a day and age where we have more information accessible to our fingertips. It's been amazing to see the efforts done by uh, folks that are not Baha'i, not affiliated with the Baha'i faith, uh, don't approach uh, religion at all from the perspective that it's coming from the same source. Um, but they have been, uh, you know, and I, I point them as if you can see them, but they're just right over here. A lot of uh, scholars that are comparing Buddhism to Christianity, Christianity to Islam, Buddhism to, uh, to Judaism, picking up picking out those core concepts and just laying it very evenly, you know, very simply showing that here are values that are common to each of these religions. Uh, again, things like the golden rule or things about loving thy neighbor, you know, uh, loving thy parents, uh, uh, being committed to your wife or being committed to your spouse, uh, things that aren't specific to the time period at all uh, and transcend those religions. Uh, and it's been kind of curious, again, being, being raised in the Baha'i faith, what caused these scholars to be so curious and, and to reach out and, and spend hundreds and hundreds of hours reading the text and compiling it and publishing it and promoting it. Uh, but I, I think it's certainly something that as we get more, no, as we have more knowledge available to us, to your point, Ray, we start to naturally see the connections between these things. And we start to want to, you know, highlight them and, and uh, put them together and, and see a bigger picture of this puzzle piece. Yep, I agree. All right, so our um, looks like we are just about out of time for this evening. Are there any other we questions for, for this? Yeah, Gary just uh, came time? in. Would you discuss a little about world versus regional manifestations and world versus regional religions um yeah i'd be happy to share a thought and alex if there's anything you want to add um so in the uh in the quran muhammad talks about how there have been thousands of manifestations that that, that god has been revealing himself to us through manifestations uh throughout time and um we i don't have the language to wrap around this so this may not come out perfectly or even appropriately that we, we know about the big world religions, right? But anytime there's been a civilization that there have been these messengers delivered to them. And, uh, you know, some obviously, we don't know about all of the thousands, you know, throughout time. So throughout time, God has been consistently with us and revealing a message to people in a way that made sense to them, if you will. So um, there have absolutely been world and you know regional manifestations and the ideas in some of these um I'll, I'll use that terminology that idea of like a regional religion right well you know it, things were delivered at a time that made sense to those people right like the idea of um reincarnation well that made sense if you're bad you're going to come back as an animal you don't like right and that's I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying that concept but it those things were adjusted based on those people so without knowing specifically what those regional religions were throughout history, each 
all of those messages, I would assume, and this is my own interpretation, that those regional messages were specific to those people, just like all the ones that we know about were specific to the time in the coming age. So I hope that's a fair response to that. But Alex, if you want to elaborate on that. Alex, if you don't mind, Hajar, is Dr. Tofiq there? Uh, does he want to comment anything? Does he want to share anything with us? Hajar? Uh, he's, uh, she's muted, uh, you know, Alex? Yep. Uh, working on that. Hajar. Mamet. Well, anyway, apparently she's muted. She cannot talk. That's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, are you finished, uh, Alex and Ray? If there are any more questions? I believe so.